Good morning. Hi, thanks once again uh, for joining us for our third webinar in the pink of health, when to worry, what to worry. Um, this is actually our third webinar already uh, and it's been an annual thing. And I'm really, really very proud of my team to actually have put this together. And um, this year, our team is to actually try and encourage our young people to actually think about um, their health more in general because a lot of times we tend to take our health for granted and think that we're invincible in this uh, in this age group and uh, just a word about AYAs in general this means that adolescents and young adults and basically refers to anybody with cancer between the ages of 16 to 45 years old and NCCS what's happening is that we are actually establishing a service to help care for these young people better so in line with all these and uh, as part of our efforts to try and reach out to our young people as well uh, this is one of the webinars that we're organizing. So without um, further ado, let's get started. And today, our very first speaker, we have Mr. Eldon E. He is a 33-year-old proud father and husband and also a software engineer. He'll be sharing his cancer journey and how he lives with stage 4 lung cancer. Can we have Eldon, please? Hello. Hi, thank you. All right, thanks for inviting me to, the, uh, to speak here. It's my very first time joining an IR event, so I'm pretty happy to, to do this. Um, actually, this slide that I'll be using, this one is actually um, an old slide that I used before when I did in, the, in my company sharing. So a lot of the information may not be updated. So the first and foremost, the most obvious one is my age. I'm no longer 33, I'm 34 now. <laughs> so yeah, um, like, uh, like what the speaker, uh, Dr. Aileen has said, I'm Eldon. And I'm a Malaysian, married with two young children. And I'm also a software engineer at Continental now. And I'm also a stage four lung cancer patient. So uh, next slide. Um, so let me begin saying how I found out about my, my cancer is that um, I was working on a, a huge topic here. So just ignore the can FD and come first. This one actually was sharing to my company. That's why it may sound alien to you. So, but basically this is the, uh, this was the project that I was working on. And during the time I altered a lot, quite a lot until like late at night, 12, 1 a.m. And, and then the, right the next day I will set up a meeting. So I have a daily meeting with my team. So during that meeting, right, I started to have this abnormal cough um, so what I mean by normal, normal coughing is that uh, normal coughing, right? It doesn't matter what you just cough whenever it gets, uh, how say, it gets irritated, then you just cough. But for me, it's only happened whenever I, I try to speak. So if I don't talk for the whole day, I will not have this kind of coughing. So it's kind of weird for me. And then I went in and out of the clinics. So basically I went to the clinic for three to four times. And each time the, the doctor gave me, I prescribed me with a stronger and stronger medication until like the antibiotic as well. But, but it, didn't, uh, it didn't solve my, my coughing. So he just suggested me to go get an x-ray done. Yeah, and then the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, thanks. So right after I got my x-ray result back, uh, the doctor, asked me to meet him ASAP. And what he found out is that there's a shadow there on the right side of the side, if you can see it. So he told me that it, it didn't look good, but he did not mention that it may be a cancer or something like that, but he just mentioned that it seems to him uh, it's like tuber, uh, it's a TB or lung infections. And he asked me to get a specialist uh, investigation to be done for this one. The next slide. So, yeah, so when I went to the specialist, they asked me to get a, a bronchoscopy done and a lung biopsy done as well to really confirm what, what it is, uh, what it was. So when the doctor first saw my x-ray, right, um, she told me that hmm, she can almost certain that it is cancer on her point of view because she has the experience seeing similar, similar cases, right? But he can't, he could and she couldn't tell me 100 percent that it's, it was cancer. So basically, right after the um, the biopsy done and they took up 33 samples from the tumor itself and they sent it over to US to run the test and it came back yeah positive that I have a lung cancer third stage um, type EGFR uh, mutations. Yeah. And next slide. 
So yeah, basically I got a result uh, early May, 2021. Um, yeah, the, from, from the day that I actually got the biopsy done and to the day that I got the result, right? The tumor has grown from 4.5 cm to all the way to 6.2 cm. Um, and also at the same time, I got a PET scan showing that there's a bright spot on my liver. So I met, uh, there, there was a time when I met with my very first doc, uh, my oncologist, uh, Dr. Dr. Amit. So he, he told me that uh, with this kind of combination, it, does, it, it didn't look good. If, if the, the bright spot in the liver is actually, is actually a tumor, the cancer tumor as well, then I won't be considered a stage three, but a stage four patient instead because it's already metastasis to the liver. Um, so I got, I went into the MRI to get the brain and abdomen checked for the metastasis. And the good news is that uh, in the next slide, um, it shows that there's actually no metastasis. The one in the liver is just a fatty liver. So the doctor told me that the fatty liver is actually a very modern um, modern kind of thing. So a lot of people have this fatty liver, so not to worry. So I'm back to confirm as a stage three cancer patients. Okay, am I going really too fast here? All okay? I think it's okay then, move on to the next one. So before I got my, I started the chemotherapy, right? Uh, Dr. Amit told me that there are few ways that we can go about this one. Uh, we can go with the traditional one, which is to have a chemo and then plus the radiotherapy together. Um, or the second one we have, we can try a different drug, uh, a combination of drug and chemotherapy as well. But he strongly suggested that I go with my, the very first one, which is to, to have a the traditional one, the chemo and the radiotherapy, because there are more studies being done, there are more results, there are more statistics there. So it's the safest bet, I would say. Um, then I went for, originally there were six, uh, is, uh, I was planned to have six cycles of chemo and 33 cycles of radiotherapies. But by the fifth cycles, uh, by the fifth cycle of the chemotherapies, the dummy find, found that um, the, the chemo has actually gotten too strong for my body to handle. At that time, I lost a lot of weight. Uh, I think uh, about 10 kgs that time. And he told me that he, he, think, he thought that it's time for me to stop the chemo. Otherwise, the, the, the bad would outweigh, outweigh the good. For the chemo itself so we ended that uh chemo and then i proceeded to see the results uh and the result came back actually quite good uh i think in, uh, in the next slide will be mentioned about that yeah next slide please all right so uh in for the chemo itself, right? There's a few few side effects that I have, and this is the uh, this this is list of the side effects that I had. Um, right after I got a chemo, right, the next day the extreme fatigue will set in, and usually it will last rough, roughly around ten to eleven days for me. And during that time, no, no matter how how long I sleep, right, I won't. I will always be tired, no matter how much I sleep. I okay, I slept right more than 10, 12 hours a day. I bet I was basically glued to the bed itself because I don't I just didn't have the energy to just stand up and walk around, and I lost my appetite. Uh, the the normal side effects: nausea, ringing ears, severe insomnia, everything. Um, all of this I'm I'm still, I I I could still handle it, but it was the insomnia and also the emotional impact that was they were the the toughest one for me. The insomnia is the is a it's the worst one for me. The reason why is because, like I said, I, it has to tie to the extreme fatigue. I was so tired, but I couldn't sleep. And that happened for continuously uh, for three days for me. It may sound just uh, like a short time for you, but I never had uh, experienced this kind of uh, insomnia before. So I was on the verge of breaking down. Uh, yeah. And also my emotional impact as well. So whenever I got chemo, right, I just don't know. I just couldn't be happy. Even though like, I, for example, like I'm looking at my wife and also I'm looking at my son. They were the, my treasure in life, you know. 
but I just couldn't bring myself to be happy when I saw when I looking when I look at them. So I feel that I'm getting more how say cold emotionally. So yeah, those were the side effects that I had. The other one, the severe throat pains, the problem swallowing, all was the all came at the last of the chemo and also the radiotherapy. Those that that was the time that I lost the most weight. Yeah, about 10 kilos there. Yeah, thanks. And next. So there are certain ways that I, I cope with uh, the side effects. So like I said, the side effects usually last for 10 to 11 days, right? And for my cycle, uh, for, uh, in between cycle, I have three weeks of um, rest time before I got my next chemo. So right after the 11th day, I will try to eat a lot. I will try to eat whatever that I can, whatever that I like. And then I will try to cycle around, uh, which is my favorite, uh, favorite um, free time activity. So I, I will always bring my son around, uh, as you can see from the picture. And yeah, I, I think that's the, that's the time that I enjoy the most. And it's kind of like prepare myself, not only physically, but also mentally to, to get the next shot of chemo. Next slide, please. And um, the post-treatment is that uh, after my fifth cycle of chemo, I uh, went to the CT scan again and then checked. The result came out very nice. The tumor has shrunk significantly from, I think just now it was 6.5 cm all the way to around 2 point something, uh, 2 point something cm. Um, and the doctor told me that, oh, it's, it's a very good result. Um, congratulations, it seems like the treatment has, uh, has has work, good uh, work well for me, but yeah, uh, the next slide. Uh, the happiness is short lived. So, in October twenty twenty one, roughly about a month after I got my CT scan result, all the symptoms that I had before I I had the chemo right all came back, like the coughing, the uh, the the tight chest uh, the chest tightness and everything came back. And I was supposed to have the CT scan in December, but Dr. Ami said that, oh, with my symptoms, we need to check it ASAP. So he moved it forward to, to October, uh, I think to end of October. So like I said just now, right, the tumor has, which has shrunk to 2 point something cm, has regrown to 4.2 cm. Uh, so Dr. Amit told me sadly that the tumor has actually failed. And I have to be recategorized uh, re as a stage four person, uh, patient, uh, which is in definition is incurable. Uh, it was actually a hard pill to swallow at the time, but I found the courage to keep on moving on because no matter what the result is, right, I still need to live for my family. I still have responsibility that I need to take on. Yeah, next slide. So, after this, uh, the next line of treatment will be to go for the targeted therapy, which I'm currently still taking on daily, uh, which is the jefitinib. And the next plan for if jefitinib it fell or something like that, someday it may fail. Hopefully it, it, it won't. Uh, the next one will be the osimertinib, uh, which is the second line for, for me. Um, I, and also one of the most uh, commonly asked questions to me is that why not I go for like immunotherapy or PD-1 therapy or surgery or anything. I did ask uh, the team of doctors regarding this as well, but they said my condition are not compatible with either one of these treatments. So, but good news is that uh, taking the jefitinib has been very good for me. Uh, it's a, I had a good reaction, the tumor is under control, it's not going anywhere, and there's no metastasis for the past two years that I've been taking, taking the, uh, the medications. And currently I'm also doing the periodic CT scans for every four to six months. I really hope it can be further shortened because each CT scan is quite expensive. <laughs> yeah, next scan, uh, next slide. So one uh, previous slide. So there are previous side effects to my current medication, so which is the list here you can see, and also that's a picture of me. Even now I also have a lot of uh, rashes here. I don't think you can see from here. Um, the rashes 
actually it's still okay. The rashes, acne, dry skin, those are just external. So I don't really feel too much about it. And luckily I'm married, so <laughs> uh, good for me. I don't need to care too much about my oral appearance to get some, uh, some relationship going on. But it was the problem with, I have problem with the diarrhea itself. Um, the diarrhea for me is almost like my daily life already. So basically in each day I will have roughly one to three times, then I need to go to the toilet, the diarrhea episodes. So I wouldn't say it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very bad. It's just, it's kind of annoying that no matter what, you, what plan you have for the day, right? You need to also include in the time that you may need to go to the toilet. Uh, that is, yeah, that is annoying. <laughs> All right, thanks. The next slide, please. Yep, this is uh, some of the pictures that I've, uh, my, my normal life, that I've, I try to live my normal life even though I have cancer. So I don't let cancer stop me from doing whatever that I love, which is spending time with my, my families, uh, doing the things that uh, people think may be impossible, especially for a lung cancer patient, which is I, I try to climb the, uh, the Mount Kinabalu in Sabah. And I went traveling with my family and then I joined the, um, uh, the cancer support group with the activities and everything. Yeah, next please. Yeah, there are some achievements here uh, that I that I have that was able to garner during the time I was uh, diagnosed with the cancer. Um, and one more, I would like to add one more achievement that I uh, that I achieved. Just last April, I was awarded the Sing Health Inspirational Patients, uh, Inspirational Patients Award for, uh, for, for climbing the Mount, Mount Kinabalu, I think. <laughs> right, thanks. I think that's basically it. Uh, is there a next slide for me? Yeah, okay. Uh, I think the last word would be the encouragement for myself. Um, these are the three things that I've always stayed, uh, stayed firm on which is the first one that cancer is not a curse. It is not a taboo. It is not a sin. So don't blame yourself if you actually have cancer. And the reason why I say it's not a curse and a taboo, people tend to keep it to themselves whenever they, uh, whoever they actually have a cancer. Right? I found out that a lot of people try to keep it to themselves and they don't share it out, feeling that uh, uh, it was because they did something wrong in their life. That's why they got cancer. But I will tell you, it's not. The second one would be the don't fight the battle alone. It, it's come closely with the first one as well. Because if you don't share, no one will know, and you will be fighting the table. Uh, you will fighting the battle alone. Having cancer in itself is already a very tough thing. So, why do you want to fight this battle by yourself? Don't do that. Trying to have at least one or two person. Be, to be with you, either your close family or close friends, doesn't matter. Just don't fight it alone. The, and the last one is that uh, whenever that you have, have doubt, right, try to seek advice from the doctor, medical staff, or profession, professional nutritionist first before asking around. <laughs> because I, 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 I know we tend to do this a lot, whereby we ask the friends, or friends of friends, ask the relative, and they will come up with a lot of suggestions like uh, doing this will, will be healthy or you take some grass or some, some kind of herbal medications that is unproven and they just told you that, oh, it's good for you, it's good for you. But the thing is, all these suggestions, they come from a good, good, uh, good point of view. They, they, they were just trying to help. But the thing is, they don't know what they're actually telling you. So the best one is to try to seek from medical professionals first. Yep, I think that's it for me. Yeah, uh, I share my journey for cancer, my cancer journey as well. So if you would like to follow me, you can follow me in Facebook as well. Yep, thank you very much. Thank you, Alden, and congratulations on your recent award as well. Yeah, I know. The, re the reward is the second second happiest thing. The, the happiest thing is actually I have another kid. <laughs> I got a doctor. <laughs> ah, congratulations. Yeah, thanks. Are they listening in as well? Ah, uh, no. My daughter is in the, in the how say, uh, sleeping there. Okay, but thank you for taking the time to actually join.
joining us this morning. Um, I, I think um, in the interest of time, what we shall, what we will do, uh, unless there's any pressing questions, let's just go ahead and then we can take all the questions together at the end. Okay, cool. For our next speaker, uh, I have a dear colleague of mine, Dr. Chiang Jianpang. He's a consultant in medical oncology at National Cancer Center, Singapore. He focuses on cancer genetics in NCC, and he works with a team of dedicated geneticists and genetic consult uh, counselors. He hopes to empower patients, family members, and healthcare professionals with cancer genetics knowledge to improve personal and public health. His interests are in clinic clinical cancer genetics, genomic medicine, and implementation science. He'll be sharing with us on topics of when cancer genetic screening is necessary. Zenbang, please, over to you. Hey, thanks, Eileen. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for joining us on a bright, uh, hot Saturday morning. Okay, so my talk today is on uh, genetic screening. When is it necessary? So I have no uh, conflicts of interest or financial disclosure. So the overview of my talk will really, really be split into three main things. Number one, uh, why is genetic testing important? Number two, when is genetic testing needed? So sorry, I'm just going to remove my mask. Yep, okay. Um, so number one, why is genetic testing important? Number two, when is genetic testing testing needed? And number three, do I need to see a clinician, a doctor or genetic counsellor before genetic testing? I'm sure everyone has uh, went on TikTok, Facebook or Instagram and sometimes occasionally notices um, some ads asking you to do genetic testing. So I'll, I'll aim to address that as well. So um, why is genetic testing important? Well, what we know is that currently the care that we have is very reactive. We often treat patients when they have cancers. We often treat uh, when the patient occurs. When, when the symptoms occur. What gen genomic medicine aims to do is really to shift the reactive care from where we are currently, where the orange cross is, down to a very proactive care where the green arrow is so that we can pick up cancers at the earliest, most detectable stage, pick up patients who have a higher risk of cancer and start surveillance early so that we can hopefully treat them early and thus cure them of cancer before they, the cancer has time to develop to late stage, stage four cancer. Hence, I would like to emphasize that surveillance is better than treatment. And so what we firmly believe in over in the cancer genetic service is that knowledge is power and we aim to really spread the knowledge about hereditary cancer conditions to let everyone know more about, uh, about cancer conditions, hereditary conditions that can increase the risk of cancer. So over here, because I'm a medical oncologist, sorry, I need to put some slides as well as some graphs in. So you can see this was one of the um, landmark studies published in 2016, which showed the importance of surveillance. So patients with Lee Farmani syndrome, which is a type of uh, hereditary cancer syndrome that predisposes them to a very high risk of cancer. They basically compared two groups of patients, one who did not undergo surveillance and another who underwent um, very aggressive surveillance with a whole body MRI every year. And you can see from the graph above, the, the red line indicates those who had surveillance or the blue line indicates who, those who did not have, have surveillance. And each drop that you see in the line is essentially a patient that has un unfortunately passed away. So you can see that the red line, the patient Patients, a lot more patients actually survive for a long period of time compared to the blue line where uh, unfortunately patients develop cancers and subsequently uh, may have passed away because of their cancer. So nowadays, we, we tend not to word, use the word mutations. In the, in the past, uh, most of us, when, when we were back in school, we tend to use the word mutation. But really, what we learned uh, and we know nowadays is really they are just really variants of the overall population. So, so the preferred term that we use now is a pathogenic variants or likely pathogenic variants rather than mutations. Also, sometimes um, when, when, when patients see oncologists, they may say, oh yes, we need to do some gene test for the tumor. Um, is that the same as the gene test that you see when you see cancer genetics? Well, the short answer to that is no. There are two kinds of genes we are looking at. One is the germline genes, which is the one on the left side of the screen. The other one that we, we do is uh, somatic genes, which are, is the one on the right side of the, of the screen. So focusing on somatic, screen, uh, somatic genes, these are genes typically found only in the tumor cells. 
And you can see from the diagram, it, the only red part is the chest of this uh, gentleman over here. And that's the only part where the gene faults are found, where any mutations or any pathogenic variants are found. In comparison, the germline uh, uh, gene faults or pathogenic variants that we have are found in every single cell in the body. And they can be in the uh, chest cell, the breast cell, the lung cell, or even the hair cell as well. Also, the other thing is because they are in every cell in the body, can, they can also be in the ovarian or the testicular cells, which results in this gene for being having a possibility of passing on to the next generation as well. The other thing about hereditary can um, cancer syndromes is that often hereditary cancer syndromes are autosomal dominant. So what this means is that all of us have two copies of a gene. But however, if you do have one copy of a gene, it puts you at a higher risk of developing cancer really. So you can see from the diagram over on the left, um, the father over here has the gene fault or the mutation. The mother over here does not have the gene fault. But um, the next generation, because you get one copy from the father, one copy from the mother, the next generation, regardless of gender, has a 50% chance of carrying the faulty gene. Moving on to part two, number two, when is genetic testing needed? So when do we suspect a, a hereditary cancer? Well, a lot of the times we think that most cancers um, are, can, are a disease of the old. They tend to happen sporadically in the later ages, 60s, 70s, and even 80s, with little or no family history. As you can see from this family tree here, only the female over here has cancer. In comparison, um, patients with inherited cancers may develop <coughs> cancers earlier, um, at the below the age of 50. Of course, that age of 50 is really a very empirical cutoff. Never mean doesn't mean that 49 you are at increased risk of cancer. 51, you are not at increased risk of uh, hereditary cancer. Also, it can affect multiple generations, as indicated by family tree. Both the grandmother, the patient, and the daughter in the family tree were all affected with cancer. Patients may also develop multiple cancers over their lifetime. Um, I, in one of my, 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 my patients actually has developed four cancers in her lifetime, fortunately all of which were caught early and underwent uh, appropriate treatment and, and she's now on surveillance with myself. Okay. However, even in the absence of family history where in some instances, um, patients without family history of cancer, they, we still suspect that these patients can have hereditary cancer, but I'll not go on into too many details over here. So the main thing is, Someone who has a positive his family history of cancer certainly has a higher suspicion of uh, hereditary cancer syndrome. But even if someone does not have a family history of cancer, they still can have a hereditary cancer syndrome. So out of 100% of cancers, the vast majority that we quote um, are actually sporadic cancers with only a small minority, about 5 to 10%, um, being hereditary cancers. However, in the patients uh, with cancers in the adolescents and the young adult age group, this percentage can actually be higher than 5 to 10 percent. So this study actually shows um, that there are more than 200 cancer predisposition genes as can be seen by the colorful table uh, over here and that actually 21 percent of patients with early onset cancer and 13% of patients with young adult cancer actually had an inherited germline variant. And this is certainly much higher than the 5 to 10% that we put for the general population. Also, there are some cancers with a very high likelihood of uh, germline uh, for pathogenic variants as high as up to 50%, such as adrenal cortical carcinomas. Pheochromocytomas, which is a type of cancer uh, that that results in high levels of adrenaline in your body and a medullary thyroid carcinoma. So patients who have this kind of cancers should see us in our cancer genetics clinic for a discussion on germline testing. Other common uh, cancer predispositions that we see are BRCA1, BRCA2, uh, made famous by Angelina Jolie, but certainly other genes as well, such as ATM, TP53, which I mentioned previously, which causes TB53, uh, I mentioned previously, causes Lee-Fraumani syndrome. 
So over here, we, what we also know is that the patients with uh, germline alterations, germline um, pathogenic variants, they actually do poorer compared to patients without germline alterations. So you can see from the uh, right, the, the graph there, more than 50%, uh, almost 60% of patients with germline alterations actually had a poor outcome compared to about 40 or 50% of patients without germline alterations. So hence, it's important to know so that treatment can be planned accordingly. Okay. <clears throat> Once again, to emphasize, um, this was a, a group in the Royal Marston um, group which actually showed that 37%, um, almost one third of uh, young adult patients with cancer actually had no family history of cancer. However, when they did germline testing, they actually did find that there were gene faults um, or that they did have a hereditary cancer syndrome in about 16% of these patients. Again, much, much higher than the 5 to 10% that we normally quote. Um, also, another thing is that in the based on the current testing criteria, actually 15% of the patients would have been missed <clears throat> um, if we just base it on, on the standard criteria for evaluation. So importantly, just because someone does not have a family history of cancer, we still need to consider, um, especially in the adolescent and young adult age group with cancers, that they may have underlying hereditary cancer syndrome. So last thing, do I need to see a clinician before genetic testing? Yeah, well, the short answer to that is yes. And um, what you should do is really arrange an appointment to see us at a cancer genetic screening. This is a distinct service separate from a pediatric genetics or the uh, cancer clinics that we run at our National Cancer Center. And what we aim to do in this clinic is really to identify and manage patients and their families. So two groups of people who are at higher risk to develop cancers. It's run by uh, a bunch of geneticists and genetic counselors such as myself. So genetic counselling typically has a four-step pathway where first we take about 30 minutes to discuss about pre-test genetic counselling, the implications of it on the ethical, legal, social implications as well as medical implications of the genetic test. If so, if, if a patient then decides to go ahead, they will then need to sign a couple of consent forms before they go on to collect a blood sample and will arrange to see the patient in about four to six weeks' time for their results appointment. All these can also uh, be arranged via teleconsult if um, it's more convenient for the patient. So what we usually do at the genetics clinic is really start with a three-generation family tree, um, capturing relevant medical and surgical history, specifically cancer history. So, so before anyone um, comes and see us, it'll be really useful if you could just ask the rest of the family whether they have any cancers, what, when they develop their cancers, at what age, um, if they passed away, what age. And in our clinic, we, what we aim to do is really to manage two big groups of patients, both the patients and the family. And what we always ask is, what cancer is this patient and family at risk of? And how can we reduce this risk? Of course, this uh, recommendation will, dif will differ according to the underlying hereditary cancer syndrome, which I will not go on to elaborate during this uh, short 15 minutes. But what I will say is the, what we aim to do is really to personalize the risk for the patient and the family um, so that we come up with a dedicated uh, surveillance guideline to help you minimize your risk of cancer. Importantly, is also uh, to note is that the gene fault can be a major factor, but certainly other factors such as lifestyle will also have influence on the patient's risk of developing cancer. And what we will say is that really one size does not fit all and we will need to uh, customize the risk and recommendation for you but this is best done after the clinic consult. The final thing I will say is that the, um, the hereditary cancer syndromes have actually fortunately opened up a whole panel of new drugs that seem to work better in patients with hereditary cancer syndromes such as a PARP inhibitor for patients with a BRCA1, BRCA2 gene faults as well as uh, uh, immunotherapy for patients with gene uh, with faults in the Lynch syndrome genes. So I'm sure all of you might have uh, seen a couple of ads here and there on Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok about over-the-counter tests saying, oh, it's just a saliva swap. Why do you need to see a doctor to, to get a blood test done? So you can see from over here, the over-the-counter test unfortunately only looks at uh, some letters in a book. So what they do is they just look at particular 
particular hot spots in the genome to, to see whether a uh, patient has this um, genetic variant or, or not. Thus, um, if, even if you get the negative result via this over-the-counter test, it may not be a true negative result. Um, in comparison, the medical grade clinical genetic test that we do after seeing a, a doctor or genetic counselor, what we really do is the and complete sequencing of the relevant gene. And so the gene is being completely spell checked and can be reassured that the, if the gene is truly negative, it is is more reassuring that you don't carry any hereditary, uh, you are not at risk of hereditary cancer syndrome. Oh, sorry. So if take home messages. Um, for patients with ad adolescent and young adults with uh, cancers um, should consider uh, hereditary cancer syndromes. There are implications for the patient and the family. Also, the absence of family does not, uh, or family history does not mean it is not hereditary, hereditary. In our cancer genetics clinic, we aim to manage both patients and their family. And there are many, many, more than 200 different hereditary cancer syndromes and genes. Um, the interpretation of results can be challenging, but always certainly welcome to ask and clarify. And this is certainly not my work alone, that's the team um, that I work with, and that I thank you. Thank you, Tenbang. That was a whirlwind tour of genetics, made easy for everybody to understand. Um, so Dr. Tan is actually not uh, not well today, so Dr. Marchin is going to be taking over the talk for today. Um, Dr. Marchin is uh, an associate consultant with medical oncology at National Cancer Center. She's a breast gynae oncologist and she has a special interest with young women with breast cancer. And she's actually instrumental in also helping to setting up the Young Women with Breast Cancer Program at NCC. She'll be sharing on the topic of I have a lump, should I worry? Marchin, please. Thank you. Thank you for um, having me here today. Um, so let me share my screen. Okay, I just want to say I'm really feeling very inspired by the previous few sharings. And I also wanted to say I'm really amazed by the work that everyone has been doing. Um, so the topic that's been given to me is actually, I have a lump, should I worry? Um, so actually, um, we all have, you know, um, lumps and bumps that we feel along the way. Okay, at some point in the body, it can appear in any part of our body, whether it's somewhere visible where we can see it or whether elsewhere uh, deeper inside the body. What can these lumps be? So, you know, lumps can be caused by many, many things. It can be, for example, your body's reaction to an injury, for example, whether it's a, a bruising, whether it's infection, and there are many other sort of non-cancerous lumps that can arise, such as like pimples or infections. I would like to sort of go through uh, three different uh, people's experience with lumps and also to sort of point out what are the things that we look out for when, uh, you know, in consultation, we hear a story relating to a lump. So my first um, example will be Madam T. She's a 30-year-old female with a breast lump. And when that, um, you know, comes up, there are always are alarm bells ringing with regards to, you know, there's a breast lump felt. But obviously, when we find out a bit more about it, we find out that she's actually a breastfeeding mother. She's got a three-year-old infant, uh, sorry, three-month-old infant. She's been having this painful tender lump for two days duration, and there's an overall feeling of engorgement. So then, actually, that could be a simple clock duct, and there are certain ways to actually get rid of a clock duct in that setting, and the suspicion for something more serious might be less in this setting. My next case is Mr. S. He's a, a 18 year old male with a neck lump. Okay. And that also raised alarm bells when we hear that, obviously. But um, then when we ask more, he actually says he's got three days of sore throat and he's got a runny nose, generally feels very under the weather. And he's got this swollen and tender glands that are quite small on both sides of, both sides of his neck. And as we expect, it's likely an infection. It resolved after a week and there was no further action needed to be done. Our third example is Miss L. She's a 24-year-old female. She's got a left groin lump that she self, um, she's um, palpated it. But what makes us more worried or in this setting, what worries us is actually increasing in size of the left groin lump over the last three weeks. She's got daily high fevers, 38 to 39 degrees. She's not getting better. She's waking up at night drenched in sweat and she's losing weight as well. So these... Um, features should actually raise alarm bells and caution us that these are things that we should be monitoring for and seeking medical attention for as well. 
So going back, when not to worry if the lump has been there, if it's getting smaller, if it's very soft, it's not bothering you, or if it, you know, the large majority of all lumps are not cancerous and they are benign. Okay, if it's been similarly in size for a couple of months, or it's actually slowly getting smaller in size and resolving, then generally this is less worrisome. Some lumps you feel or may see um, are mostly non-cancerous, okay? I'm not saying that these lumps do not need medical attention, but it's just that these things that can happen sometimes can just be monitored, including a hemangioma, a varicose veins, a ganglion cyst. Some others in this setting may require medical attention, such as an infection, um, a cyst that's infected, sometimes swollen lymph nodes when having an infection as well. The question that we worry about is, is my lump cancer? And red flags that we spoke, we spoke about were that it spontaneously appears. If it grows rapidly over time, if it suddenly, you know, um, feels the, the edges of it feel irregular, they are immobile, they feel stuck to the underlying, you know, muscles, if they're hard, and actually if they're painless, that's also sometimes a, a marker of something that is more dangerous. When can a swollen lymph node be acceptable? So like we mentioned before in the previous case, if, the, if you have a flu intercurrent or you have a toothache, you know, swollen lymph glands in the same area that are usually tender to touch, they can be quite normal. If you have an infection, for example, on your hands um, or you have had a recent vaccination, um, swollen lymph glands around that area can also be acceptable. When you're very thin, sometimes it can be palpable as well, but generally they are very, very small. However, in Ms. L's case, with other things that come up, including prolonged fever, repeated infections, if they're feeling very tired, if unexplained loss of weight or loss of appetite, drenching night sweats, or if this lump is obviously gradually getting bigger, these are the red flag signs that should, seek, uh, that should ask you to seek medical attention. So remember, trust yourself. You know your own body best. When is a good time to seek medical attention? It's always safer to ask, okay? And you should always check with your doctor if you're concerned. Unfortunately, it's been reported that adolescents and young adults may need to see a doctor three to five times before a cancer diagnosis is made. That's generally, you know, based on the presumption that, you know, we try to downplay some of our symptoms, putting it down to infections or it might also be because of presumptions by the doctor that most of the symptoms are due to non-cancerous conditions in this population, and then a presumption that we don't fall sick or fall ill as, much, as commonly as more older adults. What I want you to take away from today is that we need to know that adolescents and young adults are also not invincible. Um, like Mariam did mention previously, we need to take our health into our own hands. Okay, so more awareness needs to be there around healthcare workers, the public, the adolescent and young adult population ourselves. We need to be not afraid to ask. Health is everything. You can always ask your doctor if you're not certain. Okay, you're not alone in this. Okay, and this is your own health and you matter. What else can you do? So we mentioned breath, breast self-examination, okay. Um, in terms of mammogram screening, we spoke about most of the screening guidelines are heavily advertised for ladies in their 40s and above, but in the younger population, such as 20 to 39 years old and adult, and, uh, sorry, adolescent and young adult population, breast self-examination once a month is still recommended. Um, the monthly breast self-check is extremely important. Usually we do it on the day seven of your period starting when the breasts are less sensitive and less engorged and if there are any suspicious lumps that you um, feel please uh, seek medical attention so i'm a breast oncologist i also sort of need to sell your go for symptoms of breast cancer that we need to look out for so bloodiness discharge uh, abnormal lumps changes in the skin um, any changes on the nipple area if you have any redness or hot um, sort of red and hot skin, any swelling in the areas. So those are also signs that you should seek medical attention and alarm bells for breast cancer. What else can you do? 
the important thing also, like I see many of the questions in the Q&A section look at, you know, are there any diets to help and things like that. Though there is no um, validated diet to help in this current setting, things to do to keep generally healthy include keep active, so exercise, avoiding smoking, alcohol in moderation, a generally healthy diet, so things in moderation, um, and be vigilant about changes in your own health and to bring that up to your healthcare practitioner. This is the group that I belong to. We also advocate for um, young women with breast cancer and look after these patients as well. So we welcome any questions at the end of um, the whole session and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marjin. Okay, moving swiftly on, um, before we come to a panel later on, uh, we have the privilege of Hui Min here with us. I've known Hui Min for quite a number of years right now. And I'm so happy to actually um, introduce her uh, today as well. She was first diagnosed with osteosarcoma when she was just 15 years old. She is now currently in remission and is pursuing her studies in pharmaceutical sciences. And actually, she's thinking about getting a master's. In fact, Hui Min, you are just still waiting for results, right? About your master's. Oh, yeah. Okay, so she's here to share with us her challenging journey of getting taken seriously prior to her diagnosis. Hui Min, please. <clears throat> Hope you can see my slides. Okay. So this is my personal journey. Um, on uh, I'll be taking you through like my personal journey through photos. So it's going to be very personal. Um, so on the left right here, it's my oncologist who was in charge of me, Dr. Richard Quack. And on the right, it was a photo of me when um I actually got the Sing Health Inspirational Patient Award in 2016. So Prior to cancer diagnosis, this was who I am, you know. Um, these are photos of me and my sister because we are quite close. Um, so I'm, I'm just like a typical teenager, you know, just going to school, going for tuition after that, and just enjoying CCA. So um, on the picture on the right, um, that was a photo of me doing house chores that was uh, taken by my sister. So I actually have like a knee guard on on my left knee because my knee was hurting a lot back then. So um, the pain would keep me up at night and it was just this swollen knee that was unresolved. And who was I before cancer? Before cancer, um, my family and I would travel once a year or once or twice a year to overseas. So that was a picture on the left. Uh, we went to Australia and in the middle, in the middle, uh, it was my favorite subject in secondary school, there was science. And in, uh, in secondary school, I was very active in Girls' Brigade. So that was my CCA back then. Um, and actually during uh, my third, my sec three year, I actually uh, had symptoms already. Like in, during Girls' Brigade, when we were doing drills, um, I had a very painful knee that was, um, that kept me, uh, like, you know, it was so painful that I couldn't, I couldn't do my drills. Yeah. So, when I first started to notice that it was very painful was uh, when we had a, a trip to Japan. So that was when I felt the physical symptoms. So these are all the pictures that we took um, in Japan. And it was really swollen. And I was just asking myself, how come, how come it's so swollen and so painful and keeps me up at night? But um, I'm not really active as a child, like I don't really like to play a lot of sports. I'm not that kind of sporty girl that um, plays like uh, soccer or anything. Yeah, so it, it was like quite a bummer because I didn't know why it was hurting so badly. So of course, I seek medical help. So I told my parents that it was very painful. And after the Japan trip, we actually went to see GPs. So I first saw my regular GP and, and she told me, oh, you know, it could be some inflammation. Maybe you're just an active child growing and maybe you're just, you know, it's just like a normal growth spurt, but actually I, I didn't experience any growth spurt. So um, I had knee injections because they thought it was just like, a, okay, lack of hyaluronic acid. And I had a lot of topical creams and also NSAIDs. Um, I even tried TCM because that was what my mom recommended me um to do and it didn't work out so even after I take all the topical creams and uh even after I apply all the topical creams and and take the end seats it will still hurt after I stop taking it 
So after that, I told my GP, okay, enough is enough, okay? I have to advocate for myself. I have to advocate for my own health. So I told my GP that um, I do not want any knee injections anymore. So he referred me to SGH Orthopedic Department at Camden Medical Center. And that was when they thought that it was a ligament tear. So the specialist thought that, oh, maybe I'm just an active child. I have a ligament tear. That's why it's so painful and keeps me up at night. Until... On 28 April 2015, that was when they told me that I have osteosarcoma, which is a form of bone cancer. So there was a photo of me right after my biopsy. And I can remember that day so clearly. I went um, with my dad to see, the, um, to see the doctor in SGH. I thought it was just like a regular thing, you know. How come, how come they are calling me the day after I took my scan and just telling me to go to SGH? The day, uh, the day after. And I remember it was around 10 plus a.m. And then I walked into the doctor's office and the doctor explained that um, there's a possibility that it might be osteosarcoma because um, there's a huge shadow around my knee area and it didn't look good at all. So I remember 28 April 2015 very clearly. In fact, that's like my cancer anniversary um, because... It's the day that really changed my life forever, for better or for worse. It changed me physically, mentally. Um, it just affects me in every aspect of my life. And there's a lot of why me, you know? There's a, it's so normal because at first, when I got diagnosed, I was like, oh, oh my gosh, uh, does that mean that I don't have to go to school anymore and I don't have to do all the assignments? So that was like my initial thought. But after that, I realized that, oh, oh my gosh, I might, I might lose my leg or like, do I, uh, do I have to go through chemo? And that was just the beginning of the journey, you know, on the left, it was, that's the picture of me and my uh, PICC. It's a love-hate relationship. Um, and in the middle, okay, that was me, uh, you know, rocking with no hair um, in Starbucks with a drip. Yeah, and that was my favorite drink, matcha latte, because my mom would cheer me up with uh, Starbucks drinks once a month. It was a rare treat uh, just to keep me going. But what they don't talk about is the physical and emotional scars that comes um, during the cancer treatment and after. So it's a lot of dealing with. Um, how you look at yourself because when I was diagnosed I was only like 15 to going on 16 and it was at a period of time where you know you discover who you really are what your changes what what your interests are but it was it was a period of time where it was just like oh I, I need to emerge like a new identity and who, what do I like you know so I would say that if I were to recall on my cancer journey right now, it feels like I'm recalling a part of my childhood. And frankly, I can tell you that um, honestly, it's quite traumatic. And that's why there were a lot of emotional scars. But I would say that um, it is really tough, but support keeps you going. Yeah, so... Um, when I talk about emotional scars, there's also scanxiety. It's this new word in this cancer community. Um, basically, it means that every time uh, after you go for scans, you get so scared and then you're just like so anxious about the results because you never know if it's going to be like a negative result and it feels like a death sentence. And life after cancer isn't, oh, I'm just going back to my job. I'm going back to school. I'm going to have um, things that I'm going to experience and I missed out. It's actually a lot of fear, a lot of loneliness, a lot of happiness. And fear, especially, you know, it creeps in when you are alone at night and it's very scary. And uh, not to mention guilt. There's also this uh, new word in our cancer community called survival guilt. When you really see your friends who are not here anymore, but you're still alive. So that's actually a new word. Yeah. But what helped me? Um, I... I feel like gratitude really helps me. It helps to ground me in general. I think that all of us um, should practice gratitude in our daily lives, even if it's that something as small as being able to brush your teeth without vomiting, because that was what I struggled with during my cancer journey. And in the picture in the middle, advocating for yourself, you know, like what I said to 
advocate for herself that enough is enough and I need to see a specialist because I can't I can't do this anymore you know I need a professional opinion already so um, I think really voicing out and talk, talking to people so I think what really helped me was um, talking to patients who are of a similar age group as me because they also deal with similar problems in the AYA support group and um, I obviously after cancer journey, I also have my own therapist and that really helped me um, in my cancer recovery journey. Um, there are healthcare angels as well. So on the left, there's a picture of me and my orthopedic surgeon who helped me to reconstruct my leg so that um, it's called limb salvage, limb salvage surgery. So I managed to keep my limb. Um, that's a huge plus because I was so worried that uh, I'm going to lose my leg. And then the picture in the middle is Dr. Ely, um, the doctor who championed this AYA uh, movement with us. And then on the right, there's Dr. Richard Quack, so that who was my attending doctor. So not just doctors, but behind, um, behind my entire journey, there's like a team of nurses in like Ward 48, Ward 72. And there's just like so many nurses and AHPs, like allied health professionals who helped us in our cancer journey. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, so follow us on our AYA support group as well. We have our Instagram page at AYA.Singapore and we have a Facebook group called Adolescents and Young Adults Oncology. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Women. Um, it's been an absolute joy seeing women grow the last couple of years. Um, and she has literally blossomed into like this young lady from like the time I first met her on the ward. Um, it's been a joy, really, and very, very privileged. Uh, okay, for our final speaker, last but not least, we have Sister Chris Minung. She's a breast care nurse in SGH who is also working with Dr. Tan Si Ying and Dr. Ma Jin to set up the Young Women with Breast Cancer program. She's passionate about providing comprehensive support to young women with breast cancer that runs parallel to clinical care so that the patients will not get overwhelmed. She'll be sharing with us about the different avenues, how you can seek help if you have a suspicion and how to monitor yourselves and what to look out for um, in terms of signs and symptoms. Sister Ng, please. A very good morning to all. Thank you, Dr. Eileen, for the kind introduction and all the very personal sharing and really, really very inspiring. Just give me a while. Let me share the screen. Okay, so I've also learned a new word today, anxiety. I'm Chris Ming from SGA Specialty Nursing. The topic for my presentation will be, what should I do now? So we wish to very much advocate a culture of prevention, self-health and cancer awareness. By adopting appropriate lifestyle habits from a young age, this can really reduce the risk of developing cancer. I'll be sharing a few platforms that are developed Hoping through this will help to improve own health literacy and health-seeking behaviours. And today, being here with us on a Saturday morning, I'm, I would just like to say I'm so glad and so proud of all of you here. Being aware, with awareness, it helps to recognise own health and so you know when to seek help. It's really important to know why it's normal. And when anything abnormal arises, you will know that this is something new and will go to a doctor. I'm a breast care nurse. I see breast cancer patients in the course of my work every day. I will always share with my patients that performing breast self-examination is to know how their normal breast tissue feels like. So if there is any new lump, then they know that this is something new and they will need to see a doctor. In Sing Health, we do have a health exchange, providing useful information and advice on healthy living and even medical care options. You can simply scan the QR code on the right or Google for it. Healthy365, this is a mobile app developed by HPB to encourage users to adopt a healthier lifestyle. It allows you to track your daily physical activity, sleep duration with a compatible wearable and meal lock tool to monitor daily calorie intake. 
participates in programs, you can easily browse through the apps for upcoming activities that are available. Like the picture on the right, you could filter based on the event or location. Choose one that interests you and is convenient for you. And always remember to sign up before attending. Also participates in challenges to earn health points, such as walking 5,000 steps a day. I'm sure many of us are capable of doing it. So while you're doing it, you can also earn health points and using it to redeem vouchers such as like Five Cries, Lee Ho Bubble Tea, and also like Mr. Bean vouchers. Next, I'll be sharing more useful resources and platforms that you could consider using. Screen for Life, this is a national screening program by the Health Promotion Board that encourages Singaporean citizens and PR to go for regular health screening and follow up. The best time to score for screening is still when you're feeling fine. You can check if you're eligible for subsidized screening by logging in with your SingPass. The eligibility will depend on your age, sex, pre-existing conditions, and your last screening date. For healthier SG and road Singapore, Singaporean citizens, will be fully subsidized at their enrolled HSG clinic. This is eligible for Singaporean citizens age 40 and above, which the invite will be sent progressively this year. Health Buddy. Health Buddy um, is an app developed by Think Health Group, which gives you access to health information and services anytime and anywhere. There is quick access to conditions and treatments medicine information, healthy living tips and videos. It allows you to view, postpone, cancel any appointments at Sing Health Polyclinic or our SOC specialist outpatient clinic. Sometimes our patient will try calling appointment hotlines to change their appointment. Using this app might be even more convenient if you wish to change the appointment. The next quarter. This is a portal, a platform co-developed by National Library Board and Nanyang Polytechnic, which allows customization of your learning journey with resources across a wide range of topics, such as on digital, career, sustainability, reading, science, art, Singapore, and even wellness. Learners wellness is something that we want to focus on. Wellness is a catch-all term that encompasses health, well-being, and contentment. This helps us to explore wellness from different angles on how to make the best decision for our mental, physical, and financial health. There are expert talks in videos, schedule workshop for you to sign up if you are interested and also curated packages available. MyLine.sg, mental health concerns in Singapore have grown during the COVID-19 pandemic and is so important, not just our physical health, so MyLine.sg is a one-stop mental health platform which um, clinically validated self-assessment tool, which allows our users to improve their health and emotional well-being. It helps users to assess their well-being and match them with different forms of resources available. So resources available on this platform includes helpline, counseling services by phone, employment, financial, caregiving support, because some of us might be caring for our elderly parents, and also fitness tips. The platform allows users to remain anonymous as we do not want the users to feel embarrassed and to be comfortable with sharing how they are indeed feeling at that point of time. So I'm going to show you how this emotionally intelligent chatbot looks like on myline.sg so you can actually assess it using your mobile. But if you are using um, a mobile to view this webinar at this moment, you might want to change to a landscape mode before I play the video in order for you to view better. So this is a free online self-care service which allow you all to share your emotions safely and emotionally. Just hold on.
So if you are not available, you can always come back to do this when you are available. So this is helpful sometimes um, in supporting treatment, especially in between uh, visits with a professional as well. Okay, so you can always just end off the conversation when you are feeling better. Okay, I'm actually the last speaker and like, I wouldn't like to keep you off for too long and would just like to leave you off with some key messages to take back. So every one of us has important roles to play for our health. Hoping by today's sharing add some confidence to you in getting resources from various platforms. And it's really important to know that young people do fall sick and you know your body best. If you feel that there's a doubt, even with visiting a doctor, do not hesitate to visit another one. I know that we are all busy people, but always, always make yourself your biggest priority. And thank you all for all your kind attention today. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Christine. Can I uh, trouble all the speakers to actually uh, switch on your cameras? We have quite a number of questions to actually uh, go through. Thank you, everybody, for all your uh, questions. I'll just start off first. There was one that accidentally uh, cleared first. Um, uh, okay, I think Eldon has actually um, replied that already, so that's fine. Okay, so I'll move on to maybe um, let's go to uh, Dr. Chang first, Tianpang. I think there are some questions about uh, genetic testing. Well, let's start off with by saying, how do I know if I need to go for um, this cancer genetic testing if there are factors to be based on? Thanks, Eileen. So I think the, the, the need to determine whether you have uh, genetic testing is best first discussed with a physician. It can be primary care physician, can be your onco managing oncologist or your managing surgeons. There are certainly um, indications, but I would say the indications really are a guideline. And in the past, what we know is, is that family history was one of the stronger indications. But as demonstrated in my slides, unfortunately, family history is not everything. And just because the absence of a family history does not mean that one is not at risk of hereditary cancer syndrome. Okay. And then I think there's also a cause uh, concern about whether or not the cost of uh, attending to genetic testing, whether is it high? Yeah. So, so in the past, I would say about 10, 20 years ago, um, each gene, the, the, the testing of each gene costs about $1,000. So we tend to be very focused in, in what we do. Um, but nowadays, fortunately, the, the cost of gene testing has significantly come down. Most of the time, we offer uh, multi-gene testing, which tests as small as a couple of 10 to 20 genes to as big as 100 over genes. And the cost um, used to be about, um, is usually about 800 to 1,000 Singapore dollars. But there are subsidies available um, that we can utilize to lower the cost to about three to four hundred um, Singapore dollars. And I, certainly with time, I expect the cost of gene testing to come down even further. Okay. And there's also a very valid question, actually. Will genetic testing actually hamper buying insurance in the future? Yeah. So that's a great question. And, and certainly it's, it's one of the things that people often ask us about. Hence, it's often important to, to see us first to discuss genetic testing. Um, the first person that I would like to see usually is a patient that is affected with cancer because that's the highest chance of finding whether there's any um, pathogenic variant in that patient. And in a, in a person who is afflicted with cancer, your, can, your insurance will have kicked in already. So um, it, the, the genetic test will not affect um, that patient. 
what follows after that is usually will it affect the rest of the family members um, who have not been tested. Um, so currently, the insurance um, agency will tend to ask for family history. And a lot of times, often just based on family history alone, they can actually um, omit certain conditions. For example, if they notice that a, a patient who has not had genetic testing has a very strong family history of cancer, they may actually choose to omit um, family history alone. Um, there was also just last year a moratorium between the um, doctors as well as a life insurance association which um, basically um, what it aims to do is, is that uh, any genetic testing done in the research setting cannot be used by the insurance. So that is very, very clear. Any genetic testing that's done in the research, oh, sorry, any ge genetic testing that's done in the clinical setting, the insurance cannot explicitly ask for it unless you fulfill certain conditions. Uh, one of the conditions uh, is that you buy a large amount of insurance. And large amount, usually we're talking about several million dollars of insurance. Yeah, um, and they have assured us that the it, this really covers only the one percent of the population. Um, there is also a question about how um an appointment can be made with the hospital for the test. Yeah, so uh, if you are seeing uh, an oncologist in National Cancer Center, certainly welcome you to discuss with an oncologist. They can make the necessary referral uh, over to see us. The waiting time, unfortunately, is terribly long. Um, it used to be about four to six months. We are now cutting it down to about three months. And then we aim to cut it even further. Um, we have clinics running every day. And uh, if, if um, for, to, for, for patient convenience, we also offer Zoom consults, Zoom video consults, so that um, we can help to speed up um, the, the, the time. Okay, and one more question regarding genetics, uh, or rather two more actually. One is with regards to whether or not liquid biopsy for cancer screening availability, um, whether or not that's available in NCC. So liquid biopsy, I think, is certainly something that, that we aim to, to look out for. There have been several um, um, new, new publications that's coming out uh, based on one of the, the larger uh, oncology on, um, conferences this year in ESCO. I will say it's not exactly ready for prime time yet. It probably will be maybe in the next, uh, uh, th this coming decade or so. But as of now, um, we, we don't provide liquid biopsy for cancer screening. And what we what we will suggest is for the general population to follow HPP guideline as what Sister Chris Main said. Um, this includes patients undergoing colorectal cancer screening, cervical cancer screening, as well as breast cancer screening. Okay, and I'm going to direct one last question to Tian Pang. Um, there's a question regarding um, one of the uh, audience's wife had cholangial carcinoma and passed away 23 years ago at the age of 50. Um, his daughter is now 33 years old. And what's the probability of her contracting this cancer and must she go for genetic testing? Okay, so I, I, I will say that um, it... it I need a bit more information uh, based on this and probably better to, to see me in, in, in person and then we can discuss because it also depends on family history whether there are any other family histories of cancers. Cholangial carcinoma is unfortunately a cancer that we know relatively little about. We know that um, it's been associated with uh, some infections in the Southeast Asian region. Uh, but for most intents and purposes, we, we don't really know whether there is any um, hereditary cancer syndrome associated with cholangial carcinoma just by virtue of its rarity. Um, for patients who are otherwise cancer-free, um, in such as your, your daughter in this case, um, certainly it would be ideal if someone in the family who unfortunately has cancer, we can actually, will suggest to test the person with cancer first because that will be informative for the whole family rather than to test someone who is cancer-free. Because if we test a cancer-free individual and the, and the test result is negative, what it may tend to mean is that the person does not carry the 40 gene and um, the 40 gene, the, the rest of the family will still be, un, the results will still be uninformative for the rest of the family. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to direct the next question to uh, Dr. Marjin. There's a question regarding a breast cancer survivor since 40 years old. After yearly mammogram for 10 years, now she's actually 50. Uh, can she do mammogram once every two years from now on? So just want to congratulate this patient first for getting to 10 years and uh, being cancer free. Uh, but because of the previous history of breast cancer, so I think your breast surgeon will probably still recommend that you do annual mammograms um, from now on still. 
Okay. And then there's also a question about how whether women after menopause really need breast self-check. She's already 66 years old. I think yeah. so, she's going to answer this, is it? Oh, okay, sure. Hi, sitting here. Thanks, Martin, for helping with the presentation today. And yes, I'd actually, I'd actually have to answer both. So the first one about the mammogram, rightly said, with like what Martin said, you had previous cancer before, so you had slightly increased risk of getting breast cancer moving forward. One thing about breast cancer that's very, very important is that detected early, it is very curable and doesn't affect your lifespan that much. So that's the main aim of why we're doing yearly mammograms for that. So if we do find it early, since you had increased risk, we can treat it early and hence improve your survival and improve your quality of life from then moving forward. With the next question um, about whether you really, after menopause, you need breast self check. Unfortunately, your risk of cancer increases with your age. So a very simple answer would be yes. Breast self-check is very, very important. A mammogram is only once a year or if of average risk. If for screening, which means you don't have any symptoms, it's once every two years. So this monthly breast self-check is very, very important. Why so? Because if you feel a lump, if you feel any abnormal nipple discharge, like the infographic uh, and other other symptoms that uh, Dr. Martin shared in the infographic in her slides just now, do seek medical attention early so that this can be investigated. Okay. And uh, at the same time, uh, there's this very interesting question. Uh, is it important to buy insurance and especially in the pink of health then, since cancer of journey is quite tough and after listening to the sharing and understand that everybody has medical life? Marcin, would you want to take this? Um, yeah, so actually um, I must uh, share that when I first started working in medical oncology as a medical officer, me and my best friend, the first thing we did after the one month of um, working there, we actually went to buy our own health insurances. <laughs> so I think it's important to have your own health insurance um, early on in life. Firstly, premiums are cheaper when you start off and when you're young and in the pink of health. And generally, if you have the ability to um, at least a hospitalization rider program and all these other options are there to sort of safeguard um, and, and give you more opportunities and options if or when you do fall sick. Yeah, I mean, I think just one thing to add is that every healthcare system in the world actually has a very different uh, remuneration, no, sorry, not remuneration, uh, financing system. Uh, some countries, they actually do 100%, but in getting 100% financing, it then therefore means that there's a trade-off. Usually in these countries, what then happens is that you end up getting treatment a lot, um, potentially a lot, you have to wait a lot longer, or potentially sometimes some treatment may not be upfront immediately available to you. So there are trade-offs with every system. Um, the problem with Singapore system, if I can say this, um, is that you will benefit it if you are extremely, extremely, extremely poor, okay, or if you're extremely, extremely well-to-do, such that, you know, it will make a dent in your, in your bank, so to speak. But most of us actually are in the middle, and that's when things get a little bit um, uh, tricky. So actually, uh, yes, my short answer to you would be that if you're in the pink of health, do go get an insurance. I mean, it never hurts, honestly speaking. Okay. And then there's also this question about... Um... Sorry, can I just add something? Yes, yeah. of course you can. Yeah. So so with regards to insurance-wise, I, I mean, one of the, the questions I often see in my clinic is is, is what, what if it affects my insurance? Um, so actually, I have to say that, that overall, the basic healthcare in Singapore is, is, relative, is, is still affordable for almost all patients, regardless of whether you have insurance or not. Um, so um, unless you're looking out for, for, for some fancy single room uh, during your hospital stay and things, then certainly um, you, you may require insurance. But if you're okay with just the basic healthcare, um, uh, insurance is a good to have um, and, 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 and may not be a must, must have. At the same time, however, I do want to also um, sell a bit of go for NCC. La. I, I think in general, uh, for us, most of us uh, practicing in NCC, we don't actually um, really differentiate between subsidized and non-subsidized patients. Most of us, when we run clinics, we don't really know who's subsidized and who's not subsidized, so to speak. So actually, the kind of care I would say in Singapore that you do get um, is generally of a certain standard. I, I would say that. Yeah, okay. Um, I think this question goes to uh, Marjin. I heard that men also have chances to get breast cancer. Can you explain? I have a male friend and bigger breast size compared to normal males. Um, any advice? 
Um, yeah, thank you for the question. So definitely um, there are still uh, male breast cancers and we do see these patients, but generally this is much at, at a much lower um, incidence rate and they're obviously much rarer. I think the statistic we're looking at less than 1% of all breast cancers. Um, they are rarer and Dr. Chang will attest to that male breast cancers are also more associated with genetic syndromes and a, a familial predisposition as well. So the large breast size or rather a large um, sort of chest size itself does not um, so in, in this setting predisposed to, but again, if he has any of the features that we mentioned about in the previous infographic about, you know, a change in um, asymmetry, if there's any nipple discharge, there's any sort of new lumps that he can feel, those are the things that would trigger a consultation to find out more about um, what this lump might be related to and whether he would need any further investigations. So okay. on. Because uh, I do see men with breasts, uh, enlarged breasts, or what we call gynecomastia in clinic as well. Um, what is a larger breast size may not be breast tissue. It's true that all men do get breast tissue, even though very rudimentary. But for some people, what you see to be breast in a guy may be just fatty tissue. So there is a difference between a breast glandular tissue and fatty tissue. Of course, if you're worried, yes, do see a doctor, get it examined. And then there may be basic investigations such as a mammogram even or an ultrasound just to see how much is glandular tissue and how much is just fatty tissue and nothing to worry about. That being said, if you do develop, if a gynecomastia in a man is most common in the certain areas where there's a hormonal imbalance, usually during puberty or during senescence when you're a bit older, when your testosterone level starts to drop. But one other reason is because gynecomastia or large breasts in a man can be due to hormonal imbalance. It is also important to check for other causes of hormonal imbalances like testicular cancer. So if you come for gynecomastia, your testicular exam will need to be checked as well just to see if there's any new lumps, anything that may cause this imbalance of hormones. But that being said, most common cause is either during puberty, when you're older, or some people take certain medications, like certain heart medications, certain prostate cancer medications, or certain prostate medicines, which result in this imbalance of hormones and hence a larger breast size. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, there is also this thing about whether there's any medication to reduce the size for men. To the best of my knowledge, I don't think that there is. Um, I mean, okay, not to make light of the situation, I do know that there, there are certain situations where men can get very troubled by it because, pre, I mean, traditionally, we associated, we associate um, breasts with females, right? So for a guy, uh, generally, we wouldn't want to have very prominent breasts, like, unless you're trying to build your pec muscles, then obviously that's a different situation altogether. But I think if you do actually want to consider reducing the size of, um, of the breasts for men, uh, probably you will require to seek uh, medical attention and potentially we're going down the route of some sort of a surgery actually yeah and of course if let's say a lot of the tissues are related to obesity because that can also uh, come off as potentially like gynecomastia then one of the things that we can also potentially do is to try and keep a balanced diet and also ensure that you keep a healthy living with um uh, with at least moderate activity all right okay i want to really answer this question because i thought it was actually quite interesting. Uh, Majin and Tianbang, please chime in if you if you have anything else to say. My mom and I have autoimmune disease. Does that put my children at risk of having cancer? So the truth of the matter is that, uh, so autoimmune disease basically refers to a situation where your immune system is overactive, such that your immune system starts to um, recognize yourself as enemy, if I may use that word, and start to cause problem. So that can happen like in the joints, in the nerves, in lots of places actually. So commonly what we do here of these situations are like things like lupus, for example, very commonly, or rheumatoid arthritis. So these are all examples of uh, autoimmune disease. Now the thing is, uh, we also know that our immune system is crucial to actually help us detect and fight cancer. In fact, some of our therapies now include um, heightening the immune response in order to fight cancer, if I can put it that way. So actually, if a patient is on active treatment with um, uh, for cancer, sometimes with certain treatments, we may find that the autoimmune disease actually settles down. Okay. However, 
having said that, this is where the, 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 the tricky part is. Um, the problem is that when a person is on auto, uh, has an autoimmune disease that is actually flaring and very active, one of the treatment modalities is to actually use medication to suppress the activity of the immune system. And when your immune system activity gets suppressed, what happens then is that your body starts to become havoc, like thinking that, oh, I have nobody to kind of like um, calm me down. And in that sense, cancer can end up developing. So for example, people with low immune um, system, they can end up being a bit more predisposed to developing cancer. For example, patients living with uh, retroviral disease or HIV disease, or patients with autoimmune disease who have been on long-term steroids because steroids, while as good a drug it is, it, there is also the possibility of actually um, hampering with the immune system. Yeah, Senpang, uh, Majin, anything that you want to add? Okay, cool. And then um, there's one question. I'm 63 this year, exercise regularly, have a very healthy lifestyle and is healthy. Five members of my family have succumbed to different cancers Oh, sorry. Some I can't see that. <laughs> okay, no problem. Sorry, I just typed it. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Oh, you answered that already, is it? Yeah, sorry. I I just typed it. Uh, yeah. So yeah, no, mm. you didn't go ahead. Then, then I'll just. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Why don't Why don't you take that question? No problems. Yeah. Um. I I five of my family members had succumbed to different cancers over the year uh, over the years, and the last one being seven years ago. All of them were diagnosed in their fifties and did not survive past seventy. Do I need genetic testing? Um, so I, I'll need a bit more information because there are some cancers that are more related to hereditary cancer conditions and there are other cancers that may be more environmental. Um, so it really depends on the type of cancer as well as the age of the cancer in your family member, a specific age um, and also how close this family member is to you. Um, I'll encourage you to see me at the Cancer Genetics Clinic to have a discussion. Um, you can obtain it. If, if you're seeing someone in NCC, you can ask your primary oncologist to refer on to us. Or if, if, if not, you, know, you can also go and see the polyclinic or GP and they can refer on to us as well. Um, okay, great. I think that's like the last question that we have in the Q&A box. Um, any questions that any of you have? If I could actually just take the opportunity to also um, ask our um, our AYA voices here, right? Uh, if there is one thing that you can say to yourself who was going through treatment, and um, uh, what would you actually say? Hui Min, you want to go first? Uh, something that I want to tell myself mm. when I was going through treatment. Mm. Mm. I think I want to tell myself that I will be able to live past 18 and 21. Because that was my worry that I will not be able to celebrate. Because I celebrated my 16th birthday in the hospital, you know, all bandaged up because of my surgery. And I was so worried that, oh my gosh, I, I won't be able to celebrate my 18th birthday, my 21 birthday. But here I am. I'm turning 24 this year. I'm going to study my master soon. So. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to tell myself that. Um, hang on, uh, yeah. Okay. How about Miriam? So, uh, I guess for me it was similar. Um, I would probably tell myself that it will be over sooner than you would expect, and I'll be able to do normal life. Go ahead with a normal life. Um even much sooner than I had foreseen at that point in time. Okay, and how about Alden? So I'm actually a realist myself, right? So when I was going through the treatment, it was super tough. If I got to say, I get to tell something to myself that time, I would still say the same. It's going to be tough now, but it will be okay soon. <laughs> um. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing your personal Sorry, stories. Can I get on something? Yes, of course. Okay. Um, actually, I wished I documented my my um self-reflections, my emotions as well. I wish I took more pictures with my family and friends and documented as well. Um, I wish I, re I wish I kept a diary. Lah. Yeah. That was something that um I really wanted to do because now that I look back on Google Photos, I actually don't have a lot of photos, you know. Yeah, so I, I wish I took more photos of myself and I, I wish I had like physical reflections as well. 
Um, I just want to just reiterate, I, I think probably similar sentiments from all the people here. I mean, really thank you to the um, AYA uh, voices who have actually shared your stories. You are really the reason why we are doing what we are doing. And I mean, um, this whole AYA journey has been fantastic. And this is actually our third webinar already. Um, we are actually in the midst of also trying to raise funds to actually build a service because we are trying to get a patient navigator to help serve our young folks better. Just so that, you know, I mean, I'm sure y'all would y'all are no um, strangers to the fact that, you know, Monday come for this appointment, Wednesday come from that appointment, Thursday another appointment, Sunday come for another test on Saturday. And it's like, you know what, as if I got no life like that, right? Nothing else to do with it that kind of thing right so i mean so there are various things that we're trying to improve along the way and y'all be pleased to also know that we have launched our mobile app as well and we are also and, and this app is actually dedicated for young adults and actually it was created with um, the effort of also one of our patients one of aya patients who unfortunately has left us already lah, but he's the avatar of our app so all this is all with hope to also try to bring curated information to our um, young patients because right now whether you are 20 or 80 years old you get the same kind of information and again that doesn't make sense to me so i mean and one last thing before i conclude is that i think within and uh, Nuru. And, K and Kaylin, thank you so much for helping us um, do this. And thank you, um, Willin and Nuru, for putting up with all my crazy ideas. Do you want to show your faces? Without them, this wouldn't be possible, honestly. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to, want to do a little bit of uh, advertising. We are actually uh, launching, we, we have actually launched a Building for Hope campaign where we're actually trying to sell um, T-shirts that have been uh, actually designed by a researcher. Thank you, Huimin. <laughs> and essentially, we are trying to raise funds for our, our cause, lah, essentially. And then at the same time as well, we do have a giving.sg page called Building for Hope. So if you do help us to spread the word around, we will be um, having more AYA support group events along the year as well. So do keep a lookout. Um, yeah. Otherwise, yes, thank you very much for joining us once again and spending your precious Saturday morning with us. And once again, to our speakers, thank you very much once again. Okay, otherwise, I'll end here then. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.